I'm Barry Roger. I'm a professor here at Strathclyde University Law School and I'm the director of the centre called SCALES, Strathclyde Centre for Antitrust Law and Empirical Study. And I'm here today with my colleague, Dr. Olish Andrechuk, and also Peter Freeman. Um, and Peter is going to give us a, a, a brief talk uh, and an outline of a talk that he's going to give at an event we're hosting here at the centre at Strathclyde University. So I'm delighted to introduce uh, Peter. Peter uh, has a long history in competition law, and this is part of a series of talks that Olish has organised by eminent competition law academics, policymakers, and practitioners. Peter has spent a long time as a competition law practitioner, nearly 30 years, I think, as a partner with Simmons and Simmons, working in uh, European and competition law. He was, for a number of years, the chairman of the uh, Competition Commission. And he has also, until fairly recently, over a long period of time, been a deputy chairman of the Competition Appeal Tribunal. And uh, we're absolutely delighted that he can come here today and share some of his experiences with us. And he's going to talk to us uh, tonight about the judicial role in competition law. And I think right now, Peter's going to give us a few minutes uh, of a flavour of what he's going to talk in greater length about tonight. Well, good evening, everybody. As, as Barry says, I've been around a long time uh, and I've seen the competition world from various perspectives, most recently from the judicial perspective. And I was never really in any doubt about it, but I'm, I'm more convinced than ever that it's the, it's the judicial control aspect that holds the enforcement of competition system together. Now, that's not a view that's accepted by everybody, um, but I believe it's correct, and I'm going to try and convince anybody who's, who's more sceptical than I on that. And I'm going to do it by reviewing the way we got to our present system, and that's really a 30-year process. Ten years of consultation began in the early 1990s. We had big reform in the, in, in, at the turn of the century. We've had uh, 20 years of experience with an institutional reform in the middle, but the institutions we have at the moment are more or less the ones that were set up uh, as part of that great, great reform. And so we are able to take stock. Uh, and the key aspect of it really was that the government, in its wisdom, decided that we were not going to have an executive-based competition system. We were going to have a law-based system. And if you have law, you have to have decisions, you have to have laws, you have to have judges. Uh, the politicians stepped back. And, and the accountability of the competition authorities, who were given great new powers. I, I know the Competition Commission had enormous power, uh, but they were accountable. And they were accountable not only to public opinion and academics and you know, the, the general competition world, which judged them quite severely, but to the courts. If they got a decision wrong, or if, even if they thought they'd got it right, there was an appeal mechanism which led to a decision which could then go right up to the highest courts in the land throughout the United Kingdom. It's not just England, it's Scotland and, and Northern Ireland and Wales as well. <coughs> and so I'm going to just sort of highlight that and point to the fact that there have been people who've been shaking that tree lately, uh, who've said maybe we don't need such a lot of judges, such a lot of appeals. It's getting too heavy. It's, it's chilling the enforcement activity. Authorities are having to spend an awful lot of time worrying about how they would defend their decisions. And that's not right, because that means that um, monopolists and cartelists are getting away with things they shouldn't get away with. It's a quite a sort of persuasive case when you first hear it. But when you examine it, you realize there's nothing in it, and that actually a properly, properly organized and confident competition authority has nothing to fear from an effective appeal system. And indeed, the experience actually shows that, and uh, far from being overruled time and time again, as you might think, the competition authorities on the whole do pretty well on appeal. And it's the parties who might have the greater grievance. They might say we were too soft. So I think I'm just going to take people around that. Now, the, the, um, the government, in its wisdom, has, has been consulting for the last year on changes to the competition regime. Uh, and we are at the sort of most awkward moment because the consultation response is on the verge of being published. Um, I know it's on the verge of being published, but I am I'm not able really to say anything about what it says. So it's a slight sort of precipice type lecture. Maybe when we circulate a text, we may be in a better position. But at the moment, 
we have to ask the questions. We can't really provide the answers. I, I will say what I think, but that is merely a personal view. And that's it. And I'm trying to drape it all around uh, a quotation from um, a famous Scottish philosopher, Adam Smith, who is the founder of antitrust thinking, uh, where he said, no, no system of commerce can function without a regular administration of justice. And I think that's really what it boils down to. So I hope I can convince my doubters. Excellent, thank you. And I, I think it's, uh, we, we get a number of speakers coming here to Scotland and everyone tries to drape something around Adam Smith in some way, which is understandable. I think, well, I think the last time I did it around David Hume, so I thought right, I'd, okay. I'd, I'd, I'd move around a bit. Um, <laughs> I, I think you're right to point to this, the kind of major transformational change that took place in UK competition law you know, over 20 years ago now from the old fashioned, you call it executive, I would call it public interest kind of base system to a more legalistic system in which there's less uh, discretion involved. And I think that there's, there's two key tenets of that system and of, and of many modern competition law systems. And those are independence of authorities, but accountability as well. And I think one of the important things in any system is the is the strength of each of those uh, separate concepts. How do, you th how do you think both of those are playing out currently and in terms of the, the proposed reform process without giving too much away? Well, you're quite right that, I mean, I, I'm, I've been talking about the mechanism of enforcement, but the substance of competition law, as you rightly say, used to be a very broad public interest test. You know, you could advise whether something was out operating against the public interest. And I actually did the last public interest merger case, I think, at the Competition Commission when I joined as initially as deputy chairman. And I remember our legal advisor said, look, it's easy. You can, you can decide what you'd like. You're very safe. You, you can do employment. You can do balance of payments. You can do anything you like. Competition is over here somewhere. And there was a very deliberate attempt, I think, to stop that and to move the UK system into line with the European regime. I know that's not fashionable these days, but that was quite explicitly what was going on, to make it consistent. Now, it wasn't complete because the merger regime is always a bit different, uh, but basically the control of dominant position monopolies and cartels was the EU system based on competition and with an independent, as you say, operationally independent institution applying it with the power to take decisions and impose penalties. So it's a prohibition system, quite different from the registration system that we had before, where you, you, you could conclude a cartel agreement, file it with the registrar of restrictive trading agreements. He would then refer it to the Restrictive Practices Court and some very eminent judges who didn't normally do competition would decide whether it was against the public interest or not. I mean, it's a, it was a very British system. That was for agreements. There was a similarly arcane system for monopolies and, and mergers. So we have had 20 years of modernity, in my, my view. Um, now people are saying, well, actually, it's a bit rigid. You know, wouldn't it be nice to go back to public interest? I mean, look at all these strategic mergers, you know, taking the economic um, heights of the economy and under foreign control. We need something more flexible than competition. Those, these are siren voices. They are there. Do you, so do, do you see a, a, a form of repoliticization of competition law to some extent? And do you think that that perhaps threatens the kind of the more legalistic system in which there's more legal accountability before the courts or well, the well, competition authorities or, or whoever is the decision maker? I think we need to be precise that there is a new regime coming in for control of strategic and security investments. That's quite a complicated statute, yeah. which clearly is in the hands of the minister. Yeah. On the other hand, national security was always kept back in ministerial hands anyway, so it's not perhaps as such a radical change as you might think. Um, I think, how can I be, I have to be careful, I'm, I'm giving an entirely personal opinion here. I, I think some ministers have seen that competition is a powerful tool and would quite like to have more to do with it. But I think their problem is, uh, in the time, the two decades they have been away from the action, the subject has become much more technical, much more scientific, and you can't really be an amateur competition enforcer. You've got to know the economics, and you can't just say, I think that's a bad decision, or I think that's, that's wrong. You've got to be properly advised. And 
the, the civil servants who do this work are excellent people. There are not very many of them. They're not specialized. They've more or less outsourced competition analysis to the arm's length bodies. So they're a bit stuck. So I think there'll be a lot of talk, but I, I'm not sure there'll be any real change. So uh, let, me, let me then ask you, Peter, uh, probably as a counter argument to, to your main normative uh, proposition uh, of this talk, we can, we can mention the, perform the, 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 the reference to performance of uh, competition enforcers, uh, in particular uh, competition and market authority, quite recently in, in the kind of in, in the hearings, uh, in the communications and digital committee in the House of Lords, Andrea Koscheli uh, mentioned, among other things, that uh, full merit uh, judicial uh, uh, full merits review slows down or discourages or is among the factors which discourages um, very engaged and very uh, risk uh, taking approach or attitude to uh, the, 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 the new challenges, the, the, to the areas, to, 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 to investigation of the areas which are uh, at the, you know, at, 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 on the top of regulatory agenda. And obviously a concurrent issue is timing. We hear kind of uh, anecdotal, but still real life example that uh, the length of the procedure, if, it, if you talk about full merits, is excessively and precedently long. Um, particularly in this kind of rapidly changing environment, when we talk about the area, the, the, the areas related to digital economy in particular, and others as well. So, what would you uh, reply to this quite an, quite objective, you know, a counter argument? I, I did say there were skeptics, and, and, and I think it's it's always necessary to to see other points of view. Um, I think Andreas comments to the House of Lords were actually in the, specifically in the context of the new digital markets unit and why it's necessary even though the CMA has very extensive competition powers. And I think he was making the point, which is probably right, that if you want to move fast, uh, taking a competition decision, which is quite tricky in the digital world that he's about to move into anyway, uh, because the concepts are having to adjust to different market features. So if you're going to break new ground like that, yes, the te high, big tech companies are very well resourced. They will use whatever appeal mechanism, legal objection avenue is open to them. And I think he's right that, that there's a big struggle there. And of course, the solution that they are going for is a new regulatory framework under which, by some magic process, the companies will agree to be regulated. Regulation will be imposed on them and they will then be regulated so that uh, the appeal system is necessarily different. I think the answer to the question, surely speed is more important than anything else, is, is no, it's not. I mean, you've got to have a compromise between fairness, uh, thoroughness, soundness of analysis, and speed of decision making. If you put everything into speed, you will take fast, wrong decisions. And then even a judicial review standard of regulatory appeal will pick that up. So you can't wish away the problem just by pretending it's not there. It has to be tackled. I, th I think I'd follow on from that. I, th I think that if you follow through from Lord Tyree's letter through the Penrose report to the, the recent consultation, in addition to the speed of decision-making process, which is clearly there, the, the other key factor is the intensity of review and obviously the, the alleged concern with full merits uh, decision-making of the Competition Appeal Tribunal. Now, obviously, you have considerable experience in that context. And uh, uh, can, can you enlighten us about your views or your yeah, thoughts I mean, the, I the mean, reform I, suggestions? I think it's generally agreed that the competition decision-making process within the CMA could be speeded up. That was Lord Tyree's main criticism, actually. He wanted a duty of expedition, which I think is still, still on the table. Uh, he wanted a duty of expedition for the courts as well, by the way. I thought that was probably going too far. Um, that's fine. There are things, the, ar the argument that is, that is being put to me is that is the slowness because of the appeal mechanism. I, I find that very unconvincing. I think if you do your job, you do your job. And if there's an appeal, there's an appeal. Now, when I was at the Competition Commission, we did our job pretty thoroughly. Admittedly, we didn't have 
full merits uh, appeal possibility, but we had judicial review, which the people doing the work took very seriously indeed. And they used to say, what can we do to make ourselves appeal-proof? And I would say, that's not the right approach. The right approach is do your analysis and get the decision as right as you can. And if somebody wants to appeal, they can appeal. That's the system. <coughs> I so do think it's, in the end, a question of institutional confidence. And I think it is, it is improving. And I don't think the CMA should talk themselves into a, an impossible situation. I, I, I think they're pretty good. Uh, and I've seen some of their decisions on appeal, and, and they're, they're, they're a world-class authority. I can't see why they're so worried about the appeal system. Oh, all right, and if I understand your uh, answer to my previous question correctly, you would tolerate, or conceptual at least, the, the system, the concurrent system, or coexistence of two enforcement mechanisms for traditional ex post competition law enforcement. We would have the model embedded in, into the narrative which you have just uh, highlighted to us at the beginning of this conversation and with the new uh, you know, digital markets, you know, new pro-competition regime for digital markets, whatever the enforcement mechanism will be introduced, taking into consideration all the um, criticism articulated by those who disagree with, uh, with the approach you have highlighted, this, would be, this can coexist and then basically the, the, the both mechanisms can deliver different, probably, or different interpretation, differently interpreted objectives of, or purposes of competition law. Of well, I, I didn't say that. You're putting words in my mouth there. I, th I, I, I think the, the, the government has decided that this uh, uh, a regulatory system, which is modelled on communications regulation, to be to be frank, and indeed it bears quite some similarity to it is the way forward. They're not alone in that. Other jurisdictions around the world have tended to a similar approach, different in detail but similar. But I think it, it's, it's because antitrust competition law finds the challenges of the, the, the big tech world quite difficult. I mean, take a simple example, a lot of the services are free to the consumer. So you, you can't accuse them of charging too much, at least not to the user. Now, that, that is a, that's quite a challenging co co concept. Market definition is incredibly difficult, actually, in, in, in digital cases. I mean, from my limited experience, I, I can testify to that. So the, the worry is that a sort of textbook competition analysis, market by abuse of dominance, doesn't work. It just delivers the wrong answer. And so and until the thinking has been done to bring that up to date, regulation is an obvious sort of easy way forward. I think what I'm going to say in my lecture is that I don't think it's easy. It's easy to write. Anybody can write a regulatory system. Uh, it's going to be incredibly difficult to apply and to apply effectively. And just by dealing with, you know, just by avoiding the antitrust conceptual difficulties and actually writing out what you want to control, which is basically what, what, what is proposed, uh, you're still going to have to enforce it. You're going to have to resist you know, objections to it. You're going to have to persuade these very powerful companies, somehow or other, to live with it. I, I think it's a, it's a task of enormous proportions, which I think is being slightly taken, I wouldn't say lightly, because I don't think anybody's taking it lightly, but, but it's a sort of assumed that if only we can get the legislation in place and the DMU set up and properly staffed, it'll all be fine. I don't think it'll be fine at all. I think it's 10 years hard battle ahead. So basically, strategically, it's better to wait and to, 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 to look what, what Europe, European Union is, is doing and to learn from their mistake. That's what, what we can, can, again, I put in your, the words in your mouth. <laughs> but that, do you think that, that this evidence slowing down with the, the adoption of, of the legislation, uh, digital markets unit, is uh, reasonable or deliberate or maybe prudent in this circumstance? I don't think they have very much alternative because um, the UK has chosen to leave the European Union. It can't shelter under the European Union plans. Uh, it has to do something. Uh, and it's, it's doing something which is recognizably similar to what is happening in Europe. I mean, there are differences in detail, but the, the basic approach, which is to identify the s strategically strong companies and put particular obligations on them, is, is common to both systems. My view, and it's only a personal view, is it would be much better if we were still in the EU and we could be acting as a large economic 
body instead of one very wonderful and independent cu country, but just one country. You know, and, and, and nothing the UK does to the, the big tech companies is going to work unless it's supported and in line with what is going on, uh, certainly in Europe, probably in America. Uh, I think we're kidding ourselves if we think we can deal with this problem on our own. I'm just going to take a, a slight step back because um, I think what's quite clear from the theme of your paper, and I, and I very much like it because it links in with a lot of my research, is the focus on, on enforcement of uh, competition law and substance is important as well. One of the reasons we set up the, the centre, the Strathclyde Centre for Antitrust Law and Empirical Study is, as well as to further normative study of competition law, to bring together academics that can work in empirical research. And, and I, I think that there's the, this is what's lacking in a lot of the debate about UK competition law and enforcement from Lord Tyree's letter right through to the, the consultation. So on both aspects that you've touched on, so for instance, enforcement by the uh, Competition and Markets Authority, and I undertook some research in relation to their enforcement activity, going all the way back to the WFT and the start of the new regime um, when the 1998 Act was introduced. And although th there is clear evidence of, of faster decision making, more decisions in recent years. There was a, there was a dearth of decisions a few years ago. Um, I think the CMA has been more active. I think on a comparative basis, you see that in fact the CMA has, you could say, under enforced competition law. And I'm not sure why that is, if it's because of the procedures or the fear of appeal, um, that mantra. But the other thing I wanted to say was that your your paper really chimes with some ongoing research that I'm involved in with a number of European researchers, particularly Dr. Orr Brook, but with a whole coordinating team uh, of people uh, across Europe and rapporteurs in every member state. And what we are doing is um, looking at judicial review of competition authority decisions across each member state. We have decided to ensure that it's very focused, and, and so we're only looking at infringement, uh, sorry, prohibition decisions rather than all forms of decision making and, and review. I think what, what, what we can already see, although we're at a very early stage in the, the project, the number of appeals at the UK level is considerably lower than virtually every other member state. The, the, there are obviously parameters to the, the project and, and the, the CAT undertakes a range of other functions, you know, as well as its appeals in relation to the prohibitions. But over the period of time, so it's a 17-year period, we have uncovered uh, circa 30 decisions by the CAT. And in Spain, there are, now that's, that's, that's a whole different ballgame there, but circa 3,000 decisions. And Across the European Union, the numbers for Slovakia over 100, Greece over 200. So it, it, it just strikes me that the argument without justification, without support empirically, that the CMA has been hamstrung by all of these appeals which are holding it back and delaying it and reducing its ability to focus on its own decision making seems slightly strange and slightly skewed. Uh, there's early days in our research, uh, and, and so we can't say more about it just now, but uh, I don't know if, if you've got any comment to make. Well, it's very, in, it's very interesting. Um, I mean, it, we're talking about perceptions. Yeah. It's, it's incredibly difficult to say this is, this is not a perception. I mean, if the CMA thinks it, they think it. I mean, the real argument is, is, is it a rational perception? Yeah. Um, in terms of comparing UK appeal performance uh, with other countries, I mean, Often we're accused of being very slow. In fact, the statistics show that we are very fast. We, we, the, the appeals to the cat are far quicker than in any other jurisdiction on a, on a point of substance. Um, as to the numbers, I'd like to think that the early work of the cat uh, after its formation clarified you know, an awful lot of issues. So there's, there's less to appeal about. And also, it's the way it's dealt with appeals that have come along has discouraged people from bringing, and say, frivolous, but just sort of appealing for the sake of appealing. So if there's an appeal, there's a genuine issue, yeah. and it gets dealt with. 
And I, the, the, the full merits versus JR UK debate is awfully parochial, and I'm, I'm a little bit ashamed at having given it such such oxygen. I mean, judicial review is a generic term in European law, which means judges reviewing in law and in fact. And of course, there are going to be differences in different jurisdictions according to different traditions and different habits. But basically, it's it's a full review is what is needed. So whatever standard uh, gets legislated, uh, some way will be found to review law and facts, because you have to do that. E even if you say you're only looking at law, if you're looking at evidence, you're into facts. And that's if you can, you can see that even in the most strict UK JR decisions. Um, what I do mention in my paper, which I think is, is often gets overlooked, is that's the standard. I mean, that, you know, how much, how much scrutiny should you have by, by the judges? But how do, you, how do you consider the evidence? That's very important, because in standard UK JR, and I think in the general court, for example, there are no witnesses. There is no witness evidence. Now, one of the things that struck me, my first exposure in the cat, was the power of examination, cross-examination, and oral evidence, particularly um, expert evidence, so-called expert evidence, but on economics. So competition has become you know, a, a, a sub-branch of economics in many cases, not always, but in many, many cases. You have to get to the bottom of that if you're going to decide whether a particular decision, particularly on a, on a market power abuse dominance side, uh, is justified or not. You have to consider the evidence. You can read the expert opinions, that's great. They often disagree. You have to try and make sense of them. I mean, there are lots of ways of doing it. The way we do it is to put them in the witness box and get them questioned. And it's amazing how you can get clarity from doing that. I, re I remember personally that experience when the cat came to Edinburgh twice on both occasions uh, for the Aberdeen Journal's case. Aberdeen and Journal's was uh, a seminal case. A seminal right. case and enlightening about uh, some of the cross-examination of some of the witnesses. Yeah. Which, uh, and since then we've, we've done you know, contemporaneous examination, hot tubbing. And hot tubbing with an, with an expert economist on the judicial panel is a very powerful weapon, weapon, tool. It's not a weapon. It is a way in which you el elucidate the amount of agreement and what the difference is. And then you can then you can judge. You can't judge it when it's just a mass of very distinguished expert opinions <coughs> in writing. Uh, let me pick up on this, on maybe on terminological issue or uh, the, the, kind of the nominal issues of, of, of the expert opinion in, in, in economics. Do we consider that in these views being objectively justifiable and kind of? Uh, demonstrate or present it as uh, clear-cut, unambivalent, and um, non-ambiguous facts, you know, scientifically proven facts, or we acknowledge during this process of jud judicial review, sensu lato, that they are being interpreted or presented and by the economists depending on the uh, consult consultancy which they deliver to, to the parties. So do, do, do we acknowledge the coexistence of several concurrent interpretations of, some, of something which in the previous period uh, has been considered as kind of single, uh, kind of one dimensional and uh, accurately definable? Well, I think lawyers always want to try and pin things down into certainties. Uh, and, and I think they find when they're confronted by arguments about economic principle and evidence and analysis, uh, they get very worried because that's not a precedent that they can actually grab hold of. It's not a fact that they can pin down. It's it's somebody telling them something as as a professional expert. So what is how, how do we deal with that? Well, expert evidence is sort of given quotation marks and is treated in a very very particular way. The if you are, and it's mainly economics, but it can be accountancy and other aspects as well. So even medicine, in one of the cases, I had an expert medical um, witness. Um, they then have to accept that they are owing a duty to the court. And they have to sign quite a detailed undertaking to that effect. But they are, they are not beholden to their client. It doesn't matter who pays them. They are 
under a duty to give objective evidence to the court. And if they breach that by, for example, arguing the case, which some do, they get very heavily criticized, not only in the courtroom, but in the judgment, in a way that actually is quite damaging to their future careers. And I think we take that extremely seriously. And I mean, I haven't got the cases at my fingertips, but I could point you to a couple of very pungent sentences in judgments, which really say this expert was not objective. And, and, and we, we, we can see that very clearly. So that's, that, you may say that's just the lawyers trying to you know, put procedures in to make that work. Um, and I think there's some truth in that, because you still have the dilemma that you can't take instinct out of, out of people. Um, but you put two together, you get one argument to oppose another argument. That's quite a good way of trying to work out whether there's any substance in, in, on either side. Get an expert to, to, to criticize an expert. That, that's the hot tub process. And the other thing is that the barristers who are the advocates, they are pretty skilled too at, at finding weaknesses in, a, in, in, a, in an argument. So yeah, of course, we are, we are aware that this is not objective evidence. It's not fact. And it's interesting and very necessary analysis. And a competition system that just depended on legal rules uh, would be a very weak one, I think. And it would be prone to error. And that, that's where we started, of course, with a competition system based on rules. And we've matured. Now we have to handle the consequences of maturity. And if I can ask you, Peter, maybe uh, the question from, uh, the, on the issue which, with which you have started about this politicization, and if, we, if you look at, at the development or the evolution of competition, law, economics, and policy, it appears to be kind of the pendulum is moving back towards more kind of polycentric, to use Yanis Leonov's terminology, uh, approach or modality where different factors such as, for example, even uh, sustainable development, but also industrial policy, some others as well, have greater repercussions and implications on our, you know, narrow, narrowly defined competition law uh, community or cluster. Uh, do you do you observe this trend, and do do you think that the the that competition appeal tribunal in Teralia is being you know prepare is preparing for it, or it's something which is kind of background noise which you can not 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 ignore but somehow take uh, with moderate criticism, skepticism, or maybe you know relativize the importance of these issues. Well, there are several questions milling around in that. Um, I mean, the way I look at it is that. Uh, Competition went through a period where everybody thought it was the answer to every problem. Uh, I never actually subscribed to that view, but it was certainly the view of some people. Uh, and that was a reaction, I think, to having moved from a public interest system to competition-based system. And there were people in government. The, I think the high point of it was the 2001 white paper, which basically said competition will solve all economic problems. It will increase productivity, efficiency, Consumers will benefit. Wonderful, right? Well, you only have to look around to see that that hasn't worked. Um, I think, apart from climate change, which is which is you know an enormous issue for policymakers, you have you have uh, lots of other things. I mean, a pandemic <coughs> has shown that a free market does not mean that we have enough vaccines and protective equipment when we need them. So you have to have state intervention. Uh, pure competition has not has not has not helped us there. I see competition as a default underlying other policies. And you have to have proper focus on other policies. And it's important that competition policy doesn't get in the way of them. So if, for example, it is restriction on, on cooperation is stopping essential sustainability developments, then there has to be change. Because otherwise competition is no longer doing its, doing its job. Whether competition itself can cure climate change, no, of course it can't. But it's important that it doesn't impede the, me the other, other measures that are needed. I think that's how I see it. I think a more balanced view has emerged where, of course, wh where we can promote competition, we do, but we don't see it as a sort of religion. Competition is not everything. <clears throat> or some, some peers say that the, the, the competition must, the competition community must be more modest in this, in this regard uh, because precisely we cannot change, we cannot save the world and other policies have to be taken into consideration, but others respond to it that well, that, that, that doesn't solve 
the challenge, so to say, where we have to somehow interpret these broader challenges through the vocabulary and within the framework of competition law. If you can do that, it's not easy because uh, just institutionally, a, a competition authority is not going to be knowledgeable about all those subjects. It just isn't. I mean, when we did the supermarkets, groceries, competition investigation at the Competition Commission, two-year inquiry, 500 parties, thousands and thousands of pages of evidence, we came out with a competition-based um, set of solutions. We pushed the envelope as far as we could. We intervened to uh, deal with upmarket behavior, effect on growers and things like that, which we were told actually was probably just outside the competition uh, scope, but uh, we were quite determined to do that. Then I went on t TV, Channel 4, whatever it was, to, to to explain the decision, and all I got was, well, you haven't dealt with the environment, you haven't dealt with planning, you haven't dealt with, well, you know, why haven't you dealt with that? You know, underage drinking, you know, cost of alcohol, why, why haven't you covered that? You had all this evidence, and I'm afraid, I, I had to say, well, I'm afraid you've been allowed to. I mean, but that does demonstrate the truth of what you're saying, which is that actually there are all sorts of other issues out there which are just as important. I think on the limits of competition laws reached, uh, we've reached the, the limits, limits of today's interview. Yeah. On behalf of uh, Olesh and myself and, and the centre, we'd like to thank uh, Peter for sharing his thoughts and views with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You very much indeed.